Hello, welcome once again to Leto's Law. I'm Steve Leto. Got an email from somebody who said, Steve, isn't it true that lawyers couldn't advertise up until fairly recently? And that is true, and it's an interesting point. Uh, a lot of people might not remember this, but there was a time when lawyers were not allowed to advertise in the traditional sense, which is crazy if you think about it, but you know, most businesses get new business and clientele and so on by advertising. And of course, uh, if you're alive in America today, you get bombarded with lawyer ads right along with everything else. Uh, in fact, lawyer ads can often be quite annoying on television, for instance. But there was a time when lawyers were not allowed to advertise, which is kind of a crazy thought because, you know, phone books and uh, billboards along the freeway and, and so on. Lawyers' advertisements have become ubiquitous. But there was a time when lawyer advertising was illegal. Now, the interesting thing is I was always kind of vaguely aware of that even before I became an attorney. But when I went to law school, the very first class, the first day of school I had, the first time I sat down in a chair, opened up a book, started taking notes while some law professor started talking was ethics. Believe it or not, I actually started taking an ethics class on day one of law school. And in ethics, one of the first things we talked about was lawyer advertising. Because if you think about it, in a relationship that a lawyer might have with a client, the front end of that might be the advertisement that induces the client to come into the lawyer's office and perhaps start a relationship with that attorney. So it was an interesting exercise to go through because the case you read in law school is called Bates versus Arizona. And I hadn't actually looked at this case in a long, long time. And when somebody asked me this question, it got me thinking about it. And I remembered the fact that there was a time when lawyers, the most they could do basically was say, yes, I am a lawyer. This is my name, here's my phone number, here's my address. And they might jokingly call that a tombstone ad because it has such little information in it that it really wasn't an ad. It was simply just you know a, a thing in a phone book, for instance. And obviously, if I put a billboard up, just a Steve Lay to attorney with a phone number, who's going to call that, right? So the idea is that you'd like to be able to advertise a little more about what you do. So you have to go way, way back in time uh, long before mass media had become what it you know, blossomed into in the 20th century. And there was a time when lawyers uh, considered themselves to be like above the fray of the people who fight over money. You know, what we do is a, like a you know, very, very learned profession, but, but we don't scrap for money the way merchants do or something. And so there's always been this thing about lawyers who don't like to think about the money side of what they do. You know, what we do is just really just legal stuff. When in reality, it's a business like any other. So there were laws and rules against advertising. And many of the rules and laws against advertising had been passed by state bars. So that the state bar, the organization that you must join to become a lawyer and to practice law in a given state, would say, you can join our bar, but you can't advertise. No one can advertise. And what that actually did was it actually protected the people who had been in business the longest. So the well-established attorneys in town got all the business because everyone knew who they were. And the young attorneys would be scrapping for the table scraps, you know, what's left over. Uh, and so it was kind of an unusual situation, but most state bars did this. And in most states, it was illegal to advertise per the court rules that were or the rules that were passed by the bar associations. So what happened was in Arizona, there was a law firm called the Legal Clinic of Bates and Osteen. Bates and Osteen. And they decided to open up a law clinic as two young attorneys. And they wanted to start doing low-cost legal representation for people. And the whole point behind what they're doing was, look, a lot of stuff that we can do for people that we can do in volume, we don't have to make as much money per case, but we do need a lot of cases. So they decided to open up this low-price, high-volume law firm and to tell people that they would do a divorce or a legal separation, it was uncontested, for $175 plus $20 court filing fee. Now, this is in the 1970s, so these numbers are, aren't as crazy as they sound now, but again, $175 bucks for anything, <laughs> that's pretty good. Preparation of all court papers and instructions on how to do your own simple uncontested divorce for $100 bucks. Do it yourself. They would do an adoption. It was an uncontested severance proceeding for $225 plus approximately $10 costs. And they would do a bankruptcy for a non-business, no contest proceeding for an individual, $250 bucks plus the filing fee. Or if a wife and husband wanted to file bankruptcy, they'd do the two of you for $300 bucks plus the filing fee. 
And if you wanted to change your name, they do that for 95 bucks plus $20 court filing fee. And so they have this little menu of prices. They thought, well, how do we get the word out about this? They said, well, let's advertise. <laughs> so they ran an ad listing their prices and their services. And it said, information regarding other types of cases furnished upon request, legal clinic of Bates and Osteen. And they ran the ad and they advertised, you know, these are the services. And it gave their Phoenix address and phone number of the clinic. And it said, advertisement. And in 1976, the State Bar of Arizona had a rule against law firms advertising their services. So the State Bar of Arizona initiated disciplinary proceedings against Bates and Osteen. And they held a hearing and said, you guys are advertising. The rules say you can't advertise. They recommended a six-month suspension to suspend them both from the practice of law for six months because they dared you know, advertise their prices, what they did and how much it would cost you. And to think about that is bizarre, except you have to understand, again, that it was forbidden at the time to advertise. And so this case wound its way through the system and wound up before the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court took a look at this and said, you know something, it doesn't make much sense. And in fact, previously, the U.S. Supreme Court had struck down a similar law that had forbidden pharmacists from advertising. And you look at these, wait, 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 pharmacists couldn't advertise? Look at them now, you know? So the idea that, that, that you take a whole profession and go, you guys can't advertise, is crazy. It's crazy. So they looked at this and they said, well, you know, there's a First Amendment issue here. It's called speech. Now, it's commercial speech. That's true. And the Supreme Court's recognized different kinds of speech. And different kinds of speech have different levels of protection. But most speech has got some level of protection. Commercial speech might not have as much protection as, say, political speech, but it is a protected form of speech. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, nah, we're going to strike this down. So the court was asked to look at the idea that somehow the bar is protecting its members by forcing them to you know, take the high road and not advertise. And the court rejected the tradition uh, and said that uh, really all it's doing is creating a barrier to entry because novice attorneys, brand new attorneys right out of law school who can't advertise their wares, so to speak, what are they going to do? How do they get business? How do they, how, do they, how do they get clients? How do they get clients? They can't. So they said that it perpetuated the market position of established attorneys at the cost of the younger attorneys. And they said that that form of, of prohibition on speech was unconstitutional. So the case of Bates versus Arizona is the case that struck down the prohibitions against lawyer advertising. Now, as I will be the first to tell you, uh, I've seen lawyer ads on TV. I went to law school in California. And while out in California, I saw the worst of the worst lawyer advertisements on television. And literally just three seconds, three seconds, three seconds of someone looking at a camera going, this guy got me $12 million. Boom, somebody else. This attorney got me $88 million. Boom. They never tell you how he got the money, how the person was injured to get the money. You know, nothing about the case is just, this guy got me money, got me money, got me money, got me money. And so, the, you know, the pendulum swings both ways. But I can tell you that most bar associations in most states do have rules on advertising. So I'm going to tell you right now that I treat my videos on YouTube by making sure that I don't violate the rules of advertising. I don't consider these ads. I, I often do an entire video and I don't mention my law practice. I don't mention what kind of law I do practice. I often don't mention what state I'm in. But just to be on the safe side, if you watch the end, the closing credits of my videos, it'll say at the very end, Steve Leto is an attorney in Michigan. Here's his address. Here's his phone number. Blah, 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 blah. Because that's required in all advertising done by lawyers in Michigan. And I don't want to run afoul of somebody going, hey, this guy's an attorney, he's advertising, and he didn't put all the information in like he's required to put in all his ads. So I put it there. And I had somebody else ask me, this, Steve, what about the idea that attorneys specialize in something? What about an attorney who says, I'm a specialist in this, I'm a specialist in that? And the interesting thing is that's going to vary wildly from state to state also because there are things out there for which there are no actual specialty acknowledgements or, or, or awards or anything. So when I tell people I specialize in lemon law, 
I just say that as in that's what I focus in. I've been doing 28 years of lemon law. I've handled, you know, thousands of lemon law cases. Okay. But if they say, Steve, you know, has any bar organization ever come forward and said, Steve, you are an expert in this and you can tell people, no, 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 I'm just an attorney. I'm just an attorney. You can look me up. I'm an attorney in the state of Michigan, but I don't have any special endorsements or any special things that I can say go alongside my name, for instance, other than the JD to indicate I've got a, a law degree. You know, I've also got a BA, you know, it's a, a undergraduate degree in history, but, but, you know, the idea that an attorney who goes, I'm a specialist in this, or I'm a specialist, in many states, that's just puffery. That's just them saying something about themselves. So there's really no specialization like that, that in, in many instances, other than just simply somebody does a lot of something. And I can tell you right now, there's a law firm I know of in Michigan that does a lot of auto injury law and a lot of motorcycle injury law. And if you say, Steve, tell me who's the best law firm in Michigan you'd send somebody to who's been in an auto accident or a motorcycle accident, I'd go, these guys are the best. They're absolute experts in this. But if you looked them up in the bar journal, just say, you know, their names and their lawyers, that's just what they do. You know, and I'm sure they've all had special training. They probably attended seminars. They probably got all kinds of extra qualifications. They, they got impressive resumes. But when it comes down to being a lawyer, they're just lawyers. They're just good lawyers at what they do, okay? But in their advertisements, they go, here's what we do. And we, you know, we're, we're, we're the best at this. And that is sales puffery. And you can say that. So I'm, I, I'll admit, I'm troubled by the ads on TV where they simply show a wrecked car and then someone's talking and they go, you know, this law firm got me $389 million. And down at the bottom, really tiny letters, it says, you know, actor portrayal, not the real person. You know, your results will vary. And, and you don't know, wait, what, what are we getting at here when we have an actor saying how much somebody got somebody else in a lawsuit? We don't know the details of the lawsuit. So I'm not sure how meaningful that kind of advertising is. And I think deep down, it causes a lot of people to lose some respect for our profession because they look at those ads and go, that's not quite right. There's something, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the person I need to hire for my situation. But so, you know, I, I think a lot of industries have got that where, you know, Michigan's got 35,000 attorneys in it, maybe 37,000, 38,000 attorneys in it. We're a populous state, but that's a lot of attorneys. And the number of attorneys who advertise, like on television, is 1% of 1% of 1%. You know, so you, you can't paint us all with the same brush. But unfortunately, that's what people think of when they think of attorneys. You say, quick, name some attorneys. People will start naming the attorneys they've seen on television. So... <laughs> That's where we've come. But that's a long way from 1977, I think, Bates versus Arizona was. The U.S. Supreme Court that said for the first time, absolutely, that attorneys are allowed to advertise. And think about this. Prior to that, they couldn't. So we didn't have to watch those ads on television or see those ads in newspapers or on billboards. So there you go. Attorney advertising. Questions, comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye.